Hey guys, I hope you're having a good winter break, because I sure know I am. I'm actually out of the country right now, so this is pre-recorded. Therefore, I actually don't know if I'm having a good break or not. Strange, isn't it? Anyway, this video I'm responding to today is definitely one of the most requested videos that you guys sent me. Other than Flat Earth videos, that is. I don't know why you guys think this is worth my response, since the video uses a lot of repeated arguments that have been debunked numerous times before. Nonetheless, I'll be taking a look at it. Evolution. It's not a scientific law or a law of biology. A scientific law must be 100% correct. You know what, you're right. Evolution isn't a law, but it's not supposed to be. I assume you're talking about the evolutionary theory, not evolution itself. In that case, it's a theory, which basically holds the same weight as a scientific law. Laws aren't the only thing in science that we are certain to be true. Evolution has already gone through numerous scrutiny, criticisms, and tests, and we can say that it has passed all of these. As for the 100% correct thing, evolution itself is a very general term. It simply just indicates a change of organisms and species over time. The strict definition of evolution doesn't actually specify specify the mechanism. Rather, we can confirm the certain mechanisms of evolution through our observations that describe it. So in that sense, you can't say that evolution is or is not 100% correct. It simply mislabels it as something it isn't. As for the theory of evolution, that has been demonstrated to be true so many times that I would be confident to say it is 100% true. Failure to meet only one challenge proves the law is wrong. This video will prove that the theory of evolution fails many challenges, not simply one. I always give everyone a chance, so let's see you debunk this widely accepted scientific fact. The theory of evolution will never become a law of science because it has many errors. This is why it is still called a theory. The process of natural selection is not an evolutionary process. Scientific theories describe concepts. Scientific laws describe the pattern of something, usually through a specific equation. They're not meant to determine the status of an idea. A scientific theory is just as valid as any scientific law. I'm sure this point has been beaten to the ground already, so I'll stop here. You said that evolution fails many challenges, so I'd like to hear those failures, please. If you don't f***ing mind. DNA proves that evolution is false. The DNA in plants and animals allows selective breeding to achieve desired results. Dogs are a good example of selective breeding. The DNA in all dogs has many recessive traits. A desired trait can be produced in dogs by selecting dogs with a particular trait to produce offspring with that trait. This specialized selective breeding can continue for generation after generation until the breed of dog is developed. Many different types of dogs can be developed this way, but they can never develop a cat by selective breeding dogs. Oh my god, I don't even know where to begin with this. First of all, dogs and cats are modern animals. Scientists don't claim that one species today will transform into another species that exists today. Rather, evolution is a gradual change from ancestors in the past into organisms we see in the present. For dogs and cats, they would just simply share an ancestor, just like humans and chimps, but less recent, that is. This is specifically from analysis stemming from the process of evolution. You know what? Let's say you're right, that species can't turn into other species, or whatever. <laughs> We're talking about the theory of evolution here, which is strictly natural selection. Natural selection itself doesn't claim that speciation must occur. All it says is that the fittest members of the population survive to pass on their favorable genes, while the weak die, eventually forming a population that is more suitable to the environment. The part where speciation occurs is described alongside, not directly, by evolution. So if you're going to criticize evolution, you should talk about the tree of evolution that we have depicted, not the theory of evolution. Natural selection can never extend outside of the DNA limit. See, this thing, the DNA limit. Excuse me, but what the f*** is that? Please don't just bring up something that is non-existent and claim it as proof against evolution. New variations of the species are possible, but a new species has never been developed by science. In fact, the most modern laboratories are unable to produce a left-hand protein as found in humans and animals. Allow me to briefly explain what left-handed and right-handed means here. So many molecules, both organic and inorganic, are chiral. Chirality is a property that simply means that the molecule can exist in its mirror image form. These two molecules would be said to be enantiomeres of each other. However, chirality would only be present if these two forms are non-superimposable on each other. So any molecule that looks the same on its mirror image would not have the property of chirality. Now amino acids are interesting when you look at it in terms of chirality. With the same atoms and bonds, they can exist in either either of its two enantiomeres. We call this levorotatory, abbreviated to L, and dextrorotatory, abbreviated to D. 
In the sense of amino acids, we could just attach the letter L or D to the front of the amino acid name to specify which enantiomer we are talking about. For example, L-tyrosine. This is also the same system for sugars such as glucose. Now when we apply lever rotation and dextral rotation to amino acids, we can call them left-handed L or right-handed D. Now that that's out of the way, this creationist here is claiming that we cannot produce L amino acids in laboratories. In nature, the vast majority of amino acids that exists are left-handed, with the exception of a few that are right-handed found in certain bacteria. Not only are we able to produce left-handed amino acids in the laboratory, we can also produce the right-handed ones too. And there are various mechanisms we can use to achieve this goal. The main idea is that the chemical reactions we use will produce roughly an equal amount of L and D. That's because it all comes down to the stereocenter carbon conformation, either in its R or S form, that determines the enantiomer outcome, which can be either or in a reaction. I know it's a lot of information, but you don't really need to know the details to debunk this creationist. Anyway, I'm going to need to go over a few mechanisms now. Here is the most famous one, and speculated to be the culprit that produced the first amino acids on Earth, the Strecker synthesis. Here's a simple step-by-step -step illustration. First, we have some sort of aldehyde with an R group the same as that of the amino acid we want to produce. So in glycine, that would just be hydrogen. In valine, it would be a methyl. Two reactions sort of happen simultaneously. We have an ammonia attack on the carbonyl carbon, which is then attacked by a nucleophilic cyanide ion to produce an amino nitrile. Then, under acidic or basic conditions, a nucleophilic attack by water produces the amino acid of interest. Now, the reason this reaction can produce both the L and the D conformation is due to the first nucleophilic attack on the carbon, which produces a racemic compound. Since the carbon initially started with only three sigma bonds, the nitrogen can enter from either the top or the bottom side, and depending on which, the carbon will turn into either the R or the S form, which in turn determines the amino acids L or D form. The Strecker synthesis isn't the only reaction that does this. There are other mechanisms we use to produce the L and D form of amino acids, but due to the length of the explanation, I'll omit it for now, since the Strecker synthesis itself should suffice. If natural selection were true, Eskimos would have fur to keep them warm, but they don't. Eskimos have been identified in Alaska to about 5,000 years ago. That certainly isn't enough time for any major changes to occur, but that doesn't mean there haven't been any changes. In addition, selective pressures need to be present in order for large changes to occur. Eskimos are able to use hunted animals for clothing. If all the members of the population had access to warm clothing, there wouldn't be a selective pressure for body hair to grow. If no one with the unfavored genes were able to die, natural selection wouldn't be able to take its course. Humans in the tropics would have silver, reflective skin to help them keep cool, but they don't. Actually, the response to high-intensity sunlight would be darker skin. Darker skin provides more protection against the UV radiation. Meanwhile, silver skin would be more easily damaged. Hmm, I wonder what the skin color tends to be for those people living in the tropics. Evolution is a theory developed 140 years ago by Charles Darwin. Actually, by his grandfather before Charles was even born. At that time, science did not have evidence available to prove the theory false. His famous book on the origin of species by means of natural selection has a title that is now known to be scientifically false. I don't think creationists understand exactly how much criticism and scrutiny Darwin's work received when it first came out. His ideas were basically shunned, and it wasn't until later that scientists acknowledged the validity of it. It is now universally accepted to describe the pattern of evolution. What I realize a lot about creationists is that they tend to just flat out lie about certain facts. This person here is portraying Darwin's theory as if it's universally accepted to be false or something, when that is clearly not the case. And this applies to plenty of other claims too. For example, creationists claim that all fossils we find are mixed within rock layers, therefore a worldwide flood must have occurred to kill off a bunch of life all at once, and this in reality is simply false. My speculation is that they take outside sources, from anyone really, scientists, creationists, and twist it in a game of telephone amongst each other in an echo chamber until the idea is a complete lie. How dangerous is that? Life did not start with a bolt of lightning striking a pond of water, as claimed by the mainstream scientists. Not exactly what scientists claim, but whatever. Kids are taught that life can evolve given enough time. This is a false statement without any scientific support. Time does not make impossible things possible. As an example, a computer was programmed in an attempt to arrive at a simple 26 letter alphabet. After 35 trillion attempts, it has only arrived at 14 letters correctly. I have no idea what experiment you're referencing, but that sounds like complete bullshit to me. 
A source would most certainly be appreciated. Anyway, I will be ending the video here. I think I might make a part 2 to this. Not sure. How about you guys tell me if you're interested in seeing a part 2 or not. I could either continue to work on this or focus on other topics. As for next week or the week after that, it's possible that I might miss an upload. I will be visiting family this Christmas, and then afterwards I might be traveling around a bit. Follow me on Twitter for updates.